Do you get into the NFL? Yeah. You're so you're so enveloped in college football. Like, did you watch last night? You had Tampa Bay backdoor cover there against the Bills. I don't know what Godwin's doing. Maybe you can tell us from a wide receiver's perspective with the Hail Mary just hitting the ground. But do you watch the NFL games as well? Yeah, I, I do watch the NFL games. And obviously, you know, you, you grow up a, a football fan. You have a favorite team. Once you play in the NFL, it kind of ruins a little bit of the fandom. But my son was born when I was playing uh, for the Steelers. So he's a, he's a Pittsburgh-born kid and, and cheers on. Uh, the, the black and gold uh, passionately. So I, I cheer for them for his sake when they're playing, but definitely watch last night. I'll tell you, by the time we get to Sunday, after all the prep that goes into the Saturday and the number of hours I'm in the studio for 13 hours on Saturdays on our triple header on the SEC network. By the time I get out of there, uh, I watch uh, a little more passively on Sundays, but uh, <laughs> definitely got an eye on the NFL for sure. Chris, you mentioned your son's a Steelers fan. Good for him. He's never known losing in his entire life. But let's talk a little bit about your Florida Gators. Not as good as when you were on that run. Uh, Flor By the way, Georgia never beat you. You were 5-0 and oh against them. What does Florida need to do tomorrow to have a result like you and Steve Spurrier and company had? Yeah, I, I think one of the things he needs to do is take a page out of Coach Spurrier's book, and that's taking shots down the field. I mean, Florida looked good throwing the ball vertically against South Carolina. Now, that's obviously a very different defense than they'll face against Georgia's on Saturday. But I'll say this, I think this defense is much more vulnerable than it's been the last couple of years, and that's not necessarily an indictment of these guys. I think it speaks to how good that, that defense was, particularly the front seven the last few years that led them to national championships in each of those seasons. But I do think that they have the ability to, to be run on a little easier. I think if you're going to beat a defense like Georgia or Alabama, you got to do it with explosive pass plays. And I think on the other side of the ball, having a young starter like Carson Beck, particularly one that's returning to his hometown at Jacksonville, Florida, for the first time, playing in his first Florida-Georgia game, what better way to, uh, to take advantage of those nerves than to send pressure? And I think Austin Armstrong was going to try to heat him up on that side of the ball. Patrick, if you didn't know Chris played for Florida, you can always tell by the way they tee up the rivalry game. He says Florida, Georgia, other guys from Georgia, Georgia Florida. It's always them first. <laughs> and, no, I totally, well, I, totally recognize I'll say that. This, too. Because I went to Florida, I understand that F comes before G in the alphabet. <laughs> the Georgia people don't understand that either. So, you know. <laughs> Chris Doring, the Florida great, joining us here on Sharp Money. Brock Bowers we've answered this a million times, but as we look forward for Georgia, how big of an absence is it? It's huge. I mean, I, I you can't just say that uh, losing a guy that does as much as Brock Bowers does doesn't affect you offensively. But I think for Georgia, uh, fortunately for them, they've done very well recruiting a significant talent at uh, the skill positions around the quarterback. Uh, I don't think you replace a guy like Brock Bowers with one player, and that, that's why I think you're going to lose him Losing him before the bye week was the best time. You get a chance to, to figure out maybe who can piece uh, some of what Brock Bowers does together and how you can kind of make it work without him. But it's a big loss. I mean, go back to that Auburn game. They probably lose the game in Jordan-Hare if they don't have Brock Bowers with some of his heroics there in the fourth quarter. So I, I think if you get into the fourth quarter in this ball game on Saturday, um, you know, maybe that, that safety blanket not having him for Carson Beck does impact the way that, that Georgia calls the plays and, and the comfort that uh, Carson Beck has in the pocket. Chris, I want to go to a rivalry that many people may not know is a rivalry, which is Tennessee and Kentucky, because the Big Orange have dominated for so long. I love this spot here for Tennessee, lane three and a half, despite the fact they're on the road. Why can Kentucky win this football game against a Tennessee team that just seems to have better talent and a better quarterback than Devin Leary in Kentucky? Yeah, I mean, I, see, I certainly think it's been a disappointing last couple of weeks, you know, not being competitive when you go to Athens to play against Georgia, when a lot of people felt like maybe this was the best opportunity to beat the Bulldogs. And then coming home, having a 14 nothing lead after two drives over Missouri and letting that one uh, get out of your hands and, and basically get blown away with a listless performance in the final three quarters. So uh, I, I don't think that, that uh, Kentucky fans are feeling as optimistic as they maybe were a couple of weeks ago. But on the flip side, so much of, of – the SEC schedule is about not only who you play, but when you play them. They're going to play against a very physical Kentucky team on the heels of having to play Texas A&M and Alabama in successive weeks. I actually would disagree with you. I think this is a perfect spot for Kentucky coming off the bye week, having an opportunity to maybe get things on track in the passing game, which has been largely the most disappointing thing in the SEC, given Devin Leary coming over from NC State, the group of receivers that you had that returned, and Liam Cohen back as the offensive coordinator. Maybe you can put something together there. But I think also 
Look at Tennessee. Tennessee's a different team when they play on the road as opposed to playing in Neyland Stadium. Uh, they average 37 points uh, a game when they're playing on the road or at a neutral, or excuse me, at home or on a neutral site. When they're on the road, only half of that, 18 points a game, and they run for almost uh, half as few yards as they do when they're playing at home or in a neutral site game. So I think those are important statistics as you look at handicapping this matchup. Chris Doring joining us, of course, SEC Network, Sirius XM. Uh, I want to ask you about Oklahoma, kind of a weird spot last week, Chris, where they were listless against Central Florida, and, and now they travel to Kansas. Kansas can be dangerous. Sixth-ranked Sooners, what do you got here in this matchup? Yeah, you know, I, I look at the game as a great wake-up call. I mean, it is fine having to play 12 games of college football, and, and certainly the competition in the, the Big 12 has – uh, amplified itself with the addition of some new teams and and uh, just the overall quality of depth being greater this year. You, you don't have the ability to to sleepwalk through games. And what you know, we kind of tabbed this survival Saturday last week with so many teams getting scares. Uh, you look at uh, what what happened in North Carolina. It, it, you can lose to anybody on any given Saturday. And I think the close call that uh, Oklahoma had, coupled with watching North Carolina uh, being taken out of the, the ranks of the undefeated is a uh, something that I think will have uh, Oklahoma motivated. I do think that, that this is going to be a, a tougher game than probably people think when they think about Kansas. But uh, I would imagine Oklahoma. I still think they're one of the best uh, three teams in the country right now. The defensive improvement has been one of the most impressive aspects of that team and uh, love the quarterback as well. So I, I do think that this is uh, a, a game that Oklahoma is going to show up for after kind of sleepwalking through the UCF game last week. Chris, let's stay in the Big 12 very quickly. Texas is going to be without Quinn Ewers potentially for the next few weeks. How does that have an impact on a team that's potentially trying to get to the college football playoff? Just more from a mental spot, right? Like if you guys were to lose Danny Werfel during the 95 season or something, now you just don't feel the same. How, how does this Texas team rebound moving forward? Yeah, I think it's definitely uh, something that has to be taken into consideration, but particularly with Malik Murphy making his first start. I mean, it, it, it's tough. You're going to have some growing pains in there, and I think the coaching staff uh, is aware of that. I think they have to be um, considerate of that when they're, they're calling the, the offensive plays. Uh, but I, I think it requires the other 10 guys around the quarterback to pick things up. And sometimes I think it could be a little bit of a blessing, too, in that you know when you have a guy that's as as, uh, as, as dominant and, and, and as uh, capable as, as Quinn Ewers is, sometimes you, you you let that guy make the plays. You, you expect him to put the cape on and, and go out there and rescue your team. Now with him out, I think everybody's on notice that they're going to have to do more to elevate their game to help Malik and, and have the most success in his first start that he can have. Chris Doring, this is admittedly a selfish question, but I went to South Carolina, so bear with me. It's year three for Beamer. What's your take so far? This has been a wildly disappointing season. And a lot of the comments after the game, a little scapegoating, it, it doesn't sit well with the fan base. I love Shane Beamer, first and foremost. Full disclosure, you know, I think it was an interesting hire, much like Arkansas's hire, where you go out and get a guy that uh, not have, that hasn't been a coordinator before, but understanding that he fits the culture. And I think the fans certainly were loving him the last two seasons when he, he's exceeded expectations. The problem is they had a really challenging schedule this year. And then you factor in going back to the spring where you're just decimated with injuries from there through the, the preseason and on into the season. Now, uh, the offensive line has been just con considerably handicapped with all the injuries that they face. Uh, Vershawn Lee will be out again in their game against Texas A&M. And what a terrible matchup to go into with an offensive line that struggled the way that South Carolina has against the best, probably one or two best front sevens in the conference. So, I feel for Shane Beamer is what he's going through right now. Uh, they have a great recruiting class as well that's on the horizon, but uh, it, it, a lot of negativity around the program. And, and uh, we talked about maybe taking a step forward from where they were last year to get from, from, from eight to eight wins to more. Like I think just getting bowl eligible now seems like it's almost a pipe dream. So I, it's going to be a tough close for them. They, I don't think they win in College Station, and then they're going to have to win out in the Final Four just to get the six wins. Go to VEASAN.com slash subscribe to become a VEASAN Pro subscriber today.